Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's platform with Jor Nango and Axel Wieder on the occasion of this year's festival exhibition opening. The festival exhibition 2020 at Bergen Kinsal presents Norwegian Sami artist Jor Nango. Initially trained as an architect, Nango constructs his exhibitions as laboratories investigating traditions and experiences from his cultural background in northern Norway, characterized by flexibility, pragmatism, and adaptation to nature. Today, Joar Nango is joined in conversation by Axel Wieder, director of Bergen Kinsel. Platform is Bergen Kinsel's series of lectures and debates, and we are streaming today's conversation. So you are on camera, I should inform you all. Um, and may I ask you when leaving the space to please maintain uh, at least one meter's distance from one another when descending the staircase. Thank you. I'll hand it over to Jor and Axel. Thank you very much, Scott, for the introduction. And um, thank you especially also to the whole of our technical team. This is the second day of um, very busy events uh, under complicated circumstances and everything works very smoothly and perfectly. I'm really happy that we can have this conversation live in space with audience, which is amazing. So thanks a lot, Sophia and Jonas and Scott. Um, this talk on the Saturday after an exhibition opening is uh, always uh, a good occasion for us to look back at uh, the exhibition that we just opened at the process of making the exhibition and actually for me also always a kind of interesting uh, moment of reflection that we uh, share with um, visitors or audience and um, this was it's a the show is a big pro has been a big production, so it's also <laughs> a slightly stressful uh, was a stressful moment, and um, but I wanted to start with one question, which is uh, maybe a bit broader, which uh, has to do with your background as an architect, as uh, Scott has mentioned. Um, for me, in a way, art and architecture, there are a lot of connections. There are often unfortunate uh, misunderstandings of um, architecture as a kind of uh, artistic discipline. Um, but there's also like a more interesting take, which is about uh, a kind of using art as a space for a critical reflection of uh, spatial practices of um, architecture. And I see that as a really relevant, uh, super central point in your work. So I wanted to ask you um, how you would see or define what's uh, the relevance of um, architecture for you? <clears throat> yeah. Well, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Nice to see you here. Um, and thanks for the question, Axel. Um, I've trained as an, as an architect, um, but also as an artist. So I was always like kind of, since uh, starting studying, I was always like involved in both, both disciplines. So I really do feel like I'm situated in between yeah. the two fields. But um, the topic of architecture is always like in the very, very core of what interests me and <clears throat> also the, the backbone of, of all the discussions and the discussions I'm involved with. Um, and I think about architecture as um, some kind of a language in a way, some kind of a, a non-verbal non form of language that uh, surrounds us and that, that really is present in our everyday life um, in, a much, uh, in, in, a, in such a sort of underlying way that we forget to think about it in a way. But architecture is always there and I think architecture also really forms us as a culture. It forms us and it shapes us um, and it's really expressing who we are in so many ways. Uh, and, but maybe even more than that, I think that architecture also, and this is very important for me, I think architecture also uh, expresses who we want to be. <clears throat> and that I think is a very sort of interesting um, kind of concept to work with as an architect or as an installation artist uh, to sort of try and to frame my works <clears throat> and my projects through through that question, who do we want to be, instead of necessarily only um, thinking about architecture as a direct representation of culture. 
I think it's, there's something with that sort of utopian and sort of forward thinking question in architecture that is um, partially forgotten, I think, I feel uh, within the field of architecture. To really this like self reflective kind of um, look, critical, self reflective look on architecture. I mean, we can maybe it's uh, good to talk about that a bit further because there's also like an element in architecture uh, which has a lot to do with control, like controlling space. Uh, you say sh shaping society, shaping the way we interact. Um, but it, ha it has this uh, um, side of it to it that uh, control of space happens with architectural means, with planning, maybe in a broader sense, like uh, designing an environment, designing the world, and um, creating an order in the world. And um, uh, looking at the history of architecture was often connected to um, political uh, systems um, in colonialism, for example, like uh, adding, uh, shaping space uh, as a, as a, using it as a tool, um, like language, like education, to uh, shape uh, the colonies uh, around the world. And um, I think this is also um, an important uh, part of your kind of uh, work here and in general, that you uh, have a critical uh, investigation into how architecture functions in these situations. And we have, um, yeah, we, it's obviously there's a, a lot of examples actually in the exhibition that we could talk about uh, um, in the Gilgumpi in the Sami Architectural Library. There's uh, a lot of material talking about this mm -hmm. um, topic or aspect of architecture as a power tool. Do you want to yep. elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 oh, sorry. I think that. Um, I think I think that the connection between architecture and col colonialism is a um, it's a it's a very uh, interesting but also quite sort of uh, untalked about phenomenon. And I remember as an architecture student, uh, being Sami, um, and also sort of experiencing that the the, the only sort of half a page of of Sami architecture that we were taught during the architectural history class was uh, was filled with this sort of backwards uh, thinking gaze, this bit like sort of folkloristic uh, perspective on the Sami culture, which was very sort of, I think, disappointing for me to experience. So I think that, um, I think that, that, uh, that this relationship between Mm, architecture as a uh, expression for political tool, for sorry, for political, I guess, presence, um, is for some reason forgotten in the architectural discourse. So for me, uh, starting to, uh, or for me responding to that experience, being Sami, uh, sitting there in architectural history class as an architecture student and sort of see my whole culture being sort of uh, swept away <clears throat> in like a five minute, not even five minutes, uh, sort of small narration from the teacher. Something that really, I think it really frustrated me actually. And I think it really, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, there was a lot of feelings involved, and I actually yeah. think that so m much of the stuff that I'm doing, you know, now 20, 15 years later, is still is still kind of fueled by that feeling a bit. There's this, uh, there's this, there's this lack of attention given to these kind of questions. But they're also, when there is given attention, it's always filled with this uh, condescending, uh, exotifying, very limited sort of perspective, and. I don't like that, and I think that we deserve better. Uh, and I think also there is so much more richness and interesting aspects of our culture uh, to to work with and to to really 
even play around with. They're, they're amazing concepts that you can find in, in Sami architectural history. But there's also really amazing architectural phenomena that exist in our contemporary architecture. Uh, and I, I believe that the, the discourse around it is very important. Um, yeah, and the part of colonization and uh, architecture is a very important element of that discourse uh, to also raise awareness about. And um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. What that. Yeah, maybe it's good to uh, explain a bit about the uh, about Gay Gumpi and the library as a, as an ongoing project, also in relation to. I mean, it's almost an educational tool, but it's also uh, a way of maybe even self-organizing. Uh, it's, it's not an official library, it's really a library that you started as an artistic and research project, so it's um, bottom-up in a way. You bought all these books by yourself, you created the categories uh, uh, that uh, this discourse is um, shaped and mediated with, in a way. And maybe just to add one thing, it's, um, we, spoke, we spoke about architecture as a power tool and as a tool of um, control, but it's also actually about history, um, because um, uh, a lot of things are excluded from the way that history is told, architecture history as an mm. example. And um, so I guess uh, Geyi Gumpi is in a way also um, a tool to fill some of the gaps uh, in the way that uh, the history of um, spatial practices are told. Yeah, I'm not sure filling gaps, or may maybe f from one perspective it would be yeah. that, but for me it's, it's really much more about creating a very autonomous form of platform that is uh, taking a point of departure from, well, my world, but also the, yeah. uh, definitely the Sami world. And Giryu Gumpi is, uh, I guess it's sort of, it's an extension of the project I did as a student 15 years ago during my diploma as an architect student. I made a small magazine called Sami Huxendaida, which is like a DIY fan, fan scene uh, about Sami architecture. Uh, it's actually in the Giri it's, it's in the Giri You yeah. can find it there and read and scroll through it. Um, we're actually talking about maybe putting it for sale also in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. We have to remember to do that. Uh, but um, but yeah, so so in one way, I think that uh, that the project of sort of creating a discourse and creating some sort of a collectivity, a shared conversation about these issues uh, was was something that started 15 years ago. And Giri Gumpi, which is a newer sort of more spatialized format of the same intention, uh, is now presented here in the in the exhibition as the sort of as the, the main heart, uh, the first room that you enter into when you come into the exhibition. Um, yeah, and, uh, and the collectivity of that is like, it's really important. I, don't, I, remember, I remember when I sort of got the idea to, to build this small library structure. Uh, it's, it's only three years ago, but it was, there was uh, a couple of students who were contacting me from Finland and uh, they were doing some project on Sami architecture. They were very interested in it. They had found me online and they wanted to have conversations with me about it. And, and then I ended up, through some conversation with these students, I ended up inviting them home to, to me and also to spend a week in Tromsø in my studio, <laughs> which was really nice, but it was a little bit um, inconvenient to have someone sitting flipping through my books. Uh, while I was working in my studio for a couple of days. <laughs> so then I realized that hey, maybe I should actually take this, uh, all this rich and very diverse research material that I've been gathering for yeah, 20 years, uh, 15 years, uh, and, and make it, make it um, public or at least accessible uh, in a way that wasn't only through me in a way. Uh, so that's where the idea started, and, and the Giri Gumpi project was also initiated as a as a as a performance. The way we built it, so it, or perform or an installation, like it was like a social event that took place in Harstad during Festspillene in Nordnorge <coughs> and other 
festspill uh, arrangement in Norway. And, um, and for that project, we, during the course of two weeks, we built that small library structure that you see downstairs, exploded downstairs, uh, or deconstructed. And parallel to that, we also held a seminar on Sami architecture. So we invited um, all the voices and the prominent architects that have been involved with shaping our contemporary Sami architecture. Like, for example, Stein P. Halvorsen, which is a big architect in Oslo. He sort of founded his whole office, Halvorsen, Stein P. Halvorsen Architects, um, uh, as a consequence of winning the competition for the Sami Parliament building in Karasok, which is a it's an amazing piece of architecture. So he came and he told us about his ideas about Sami architecture and how the Sami parliament came about. And so we had a whole day of seminar uh, and we videotaped it all. It's also in the Giri Gumpi and one of the video screens there. You can see the whole, uh, the whole four hour long uh, video if you're interested. And it's also texted in French if <laughs> <laughs> someone speaks French. Um, but yeah, and as a part of the seminar, we also invited all the Sami architects that exist, uh, which was also an attempt to sort of, in a more sort of realistic way, try and actually establish the, the first step towards creating a Sami architectural association, uh, which we still are working on. And we are, uh, we are nine architects. Uh, so it was a doable thing to, mm -hmm. to invite everyone and fly them in. Not everyone could come, unfortunately. But but we were five, six architects there, and we, yeah, we had the first meeting. We didn't establish the association as I was kind of hoping for, but I'm pretty sure that that will come uh, in the future. So, so this idea of collectivity of the shared space of this sort of uh, living discussion, it's, a, it's really in the core of that whole project. Uh, and what better format to do that through than a library? That's the whole concept of a library, even in the Greek civilization, mm -hmm. the whole, the whole uh, that type, that architectural typology is, I think, is a, is a very um, beautiful and important one in our society. And it is also an amazing collection of books. I was uh, browsing through uh, what you have gathered. It's really uh, very substantial and uh, very broad. Um, so different types of um, publications, self-made zines, hard to get dissertations, that's, um, and actually old books also. It's not just um, yeah, reading really looking into yeah, history. Lately I've been geeking out a bit on uh, Ernst Monker, this like lapolog and ethnographer from Sweden, who has done this amazing uh, uh, mapping of traditional Sami architecture on, uh, in the Swedish mountains. And, I have uh, skimmed through the, a lot of Swedish antiquariums and bought a lot of really expensive uh, old books that, uh, that are also super important for me, sources of, of the, um, you have to, to dive into the traditional architecture. But let's um, move a bit further into the exhibition maybe also. Um, and. Uh, but you said before about architecture as a, as a kind of uh, medium in which to think also about uh, the society we want to be. Maybe um, something is, uh, of that is in Gallery One, the new installation you made with um, the big Hollywood screen, screen um, and uh, video and sound installation. Do you want to talk about yeah, that the, space maybe. Yeah, that space is and like um, was it super atmospheric? Also, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's organized a bit like that. That I wanted it to, I wanted you to sort of enter into the discourse a bit like dry theor theory, like whatever you want to access, and then I wanted to create that big room into something. I think about it as a more spiritual room, so it, it contains some very very strong spiritual elements. Uh, that room and and one of them is obviously an old drum that we borrowed from the from the museum here in, in Bergen. Uh, it has a very s sort of special history, uh, which I'm not gonna go into details about now, but you can read the text about it uh, that's laying next to the drum, and it's, it is a, it's a Greenlandic drum that was uh, in the middle of last, or 
the middle of the 18th century, uh, faked by the university um, museum's director to appear as a Sami drum. So there's a whole history around this, uh, which I think is uh, extremely interesting as an, as an example of, um, of how these, these type of images and histories are written. Um, in terms and 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 our our and the Sami history of actually not owning the right to our own history, yeah. And the drums, the drums, the whole history around the drum is a is a big issue. There's a, in this day non Sami drums that are owned by our own culture. There are many drums owned by Germans, yeah. Norwegian, Danish institutions, but we have none, uh, which is. Insane. Uh, yeah, so that story around the drum is a strong story, and I find it <clears throat> also very giving to be able to work with Matthias Dumbolt, who wrote the text, and who's uh, actually Bergen, from Bergen, an art historian who's uh, a good friend of mine and a, a, a voice that's been raising awareness around the colonial history of the Nordic nations, which is a very forgotten topic in art history. So I'm glad that he's doing that and I'm very thankful for his contribution to the exhibition. Uh, yeah. So that's one element and then then we have me and my partner Tanya Bussi, we run this small project called Nomadic Library where we republish publications. And for this issue we have republished some uh, old paintings from uh, a poet and artist called Mari Sombi from Tromsø. Uh, and she has also uh, written small blessings uh, for the paintings, which you can find uh, laying on the floor as posters. So they're called Blessings for Bergen. Uh, and they also, we also printed some very, very large uh, blown up uh, banners of these same paintings, which are filled with this uh, extreme rich and positive type of color uh, that it's an attempt from her side to really give energy to the room. And I think that they really work in that way, that there's something with the power of these, these colors that are so free and so expressive and so generous in a way. So, so we place them in the back of the room, sort of framing the whole room and also trying to sort of infuse more of this uplifting, a bit like spiritual kind of energy. And then of course, in the very end of the room, we have the the Halibut stomach screen, uh, which, is a, which is a project called Skjevvar, which is an old Sami word that I found in a, in a, in a dictionary made by Just Kvigsta, another uh, ethnographer uh, from, uh, that was active in the north of Norway, mapping a lot of Sami language. And he, from the area around Tromsø, I found this word Skjevvar uh, in an old book, and it means uh, literally in the dictionary it says, Skjevar is uh, dried and stretched halibut stomach uh, put over a wooden frame used as a window. So apparently it's this old traditional technology to make windows where guts and stomachs skins were used. And I've seen this in, in Greenland as well, where they use seal skins and walrus skins for the same purpose. When you stretch them and you dry them, they become transparent. And I looked for images of this, I didn't find any, and I talked to museologists. There was like absolutely no information about this Hollywood stomach material. So um, last year, I, on an invitation from the, actually the Chicago Architecture Biennale, I proposed to, to create, recreate a window based on this Hollywood stomach material. Uh, and then I started to explore it, and I worked with it for a couple of months, and I sewed it together with sinew from the backbone of a reindeer, uh, also an old technology that I thought would sort of fit with this old sort of materiality. And um, I realized very soon that it wasn't as transparent as I was kind of thinking. It was more translucent. And then I realized it was almost the same as this back projection screen that I've been using for some video screenings. And then I started to explore that further and I brought in um, uh, two other artists, uh, a sound uh, artist and musician, Alexander Risa, who's sitting there, and uh, Marcus Garvin, 
as an animator from an artist working with 3D animation from Tromsø. And uh, they created this sort of audiovisual uh, atmospheric piece uh, based on some of the elements that we were dealing with, the underwater and the, uh, um, yeah, some of this sort of seascape kind of energies. So it's, and it, it's a piece that became very atmospheric and very, for me, more emotional than maybe theoretical, as some of the other works are. So that screen and the way it's mounted as sort of is something that I wanted to create this like space around, and I wanted to sort of lift it up and create an, kind of an energy or something, a bit uh, going a bit new agey <laughs> in that room, I think. And I think it worked quite well. Uh, yeah, and then of course that the whole space and <clears throat> is also it's like kind of a uh, a collage or like an experimental form of Sami space because I used a traditional way to make a floor in a level with the uh, birch branches and uh, reindeer skins on top, which is how we make the lohiti or the the floors in the Sami level, and it has this smell, so. That is also really sort of a, an addition, I think, to that bit like s sensing room or that uh, yeah. emotional part of it. There's also the, the smell is like the the birch, but also uh, still the Hollywood uh, skin also have some kind of smell in the space, which is um, hard to figure out what it really is. Before yeah, you know. it's a bit the sweet yeah. taste and smell. And uh, well, what's uh, really interesting in that space for me, which has to do a lot with your work in general, is also um, the way that you use traditional elements and um, something that is uh, very connected to Sami building or cultural traditions, but uh, they're not like... Um, aestheticized or turned into ethnographic objects, but mixed or expanded with uh, contemporary materials, elements that come from, sometimes also from different um, uh, backgrounds. So there's always this kind of like um, carefulness with not pushing a tradition into a corner. And um, that's, for example, with um, uh, in that space, yeah, using the way that uh, Skievor is um, using the Hollywood uh, as a screen, but also, for example, with um, the inner tents, the Raga Sat, um, how they are um, on the one hand connected to the uh, beautiful trees and then pink poles in the middle as well, because um, it, uh, we needed some way of fixing it. And uh, it was a quick and beautiful solution, but not at all um, uh, in the same kind of um, aesthetic uh, world, maybe. So that's really, I think, is uh, important because it points to uh, an understanding of um, um, a spatial practice um, as not something that's kind of formally framed, but more as an approach. You talked um, a lot about, um, mm. I mean, it's also an important aspect of your word is work is um, the improvisational quality, is something that's more, it's a conceptual quality and not a formal aspect that you find um, interesting and that you push. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I worked a lot with that. And that's yeah. also been a really, it's like a, a big, um, Part and a very important sort of red thread through a lot of my project is this the Sami competence of improvisation, which I coined it once, or, yeah. or indigenuity, which is another term I've used on it, which is this like capability to, to solve problems in situations, to build a bit sort of uh, with what you have, to reuse things. To, there's this like very pragmatic or die hard pragmatism as my cousin once called it, uh, that exists in many of these these uh, areas up north that are that are creating a special kind of aesthetic expression that many outsiders, when they see it, think about as messy 
or entirety, but I think it's uh, all uh, kind of a matter of context and the matter of which eyes it looks, because it's uh, it's an it's a direct expression of of resource economical thinking, for example, or capacity to use whatever you have. I think that's a that's a very uh, yeah, it's a sustain, sustainable actually a quality to it. Uh, using local materials, for example, that I think the world really needs more of. I think that globalization and this like kind of consumer culture that architecture is a part of elevating is something that we really need to think critically about and question ourselves if that's really where we want to go. Um, and I, I think that this this attitude, this mm -hmm. attitude that you find in a lot of these traditional Sami areas and other, not only Sami areas, of course also in Norwegian rural areas. I, I think that that ingenuity or that competence of improvisation, which is a more generic term to it, um, is, uh, it's an attitude. And, it's mm -hmm. a, and there's something important for me to keep bringing up and to keep working around and learn from, actually. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, I'm also really interested, like you said, to use this traditional uh, elements and to look sort of backwards in time is something for me, I guess I grew up with a bit uh, through my, my father's books, book collection, for example, sitting over there. It's, it's like my, a lot of, um, there's a lot of interesting uh, things in history that I always, I'm very attracted to. And I love, I love that way of sort of projecting myself in a way, like dream like uh, dreaming myself away and backwards in time. And there's actually a really nice archi architect called Johanny Pallasma. He was a it's very inspirational Finnish architect for me when I was studying. And he once said that uh, to create something new, you have to look for that which is ancient. And I find that quite beautiful. It's a very simple kind of quote, but there's something, there's something in that which I feel like that Skeva project is mm. sort of really trying to do in a way, like very literally, actually. Uh, but there's, yeah, and I, a bit sort of, yeah, and I call that project uh, some kind of ancient futurism mm -hmm. as well, yeah. uh, which I think is a bit like descriptive of that type of aesthetics that I'm reaching for in that project. And I, but I, I like that, and it's a very personal kind of thing for me to reach for that sort of traditional, a bit like ancient uh, kind of technology. It's, a, it's an attraction. It comes from deep inside of me. Just, yeah, I'm pulled in that way. Um, speaking about reuse and uh, the kind of uh, recycling uh, attitude, the space that is really kind of directly about that is uh, probably Gallery 3, um, European, the European Everything space being mainly about um, a project you developed uh, initially starting 2017, European Everything, uh, which is in a way very much about materials and uh, their circulation. Um, do you want to talk about that? Um. Bit. Yeah, it's that. It's kind of that project. Is a, I feel like in one way it's the hardest to talk about because uh, it's uh, what sort of holds that project together is this investigation into the word flow. That's kind of where it started. Mm -hmm. Flow. I was really interested in this like very abstract and very difficult term that can you you can talk about flow in so many different ways and it doesn't really. It's, it's a very immaterial kind of word um, but but that project was was organized through a car trip from the very very far north of Europe to the very south of Norway no, of Europe um, uh, in a red big Mercedes that I filled with stuff uh, back home in Tromsø and I drove slowly during the course of two months to Athens and on that road trip, I <clears throat> gathered things, I traded things, I met people, uh, looked into uh, a lot of marginal ethnical groups, 
people that didn't belong to a nation state. So I was kind of trying to look at Europe uh, beyond this sort of nation state border. I was looking at Europe as one piece of land and trying to sort of map all this like uh, minor sort of shadow zones of Europe in a way. And that's where it started. I really connected with a lot of uh, Roma people in the north of Romania and I spent a lot of time there meeting a lot of craftsmen um, that were working with traditional craft. Again, this bit like sort of attraction to some old technology. And I met one Roma coppersmith called L Laios Gabur or Lali, <clears throat> who's been here now in Bergen for two weeks. He just left today, mm -hmm. this morning. Um, but together with him, we created this, we started this collaborative exploration of material flow, reuse, and improvisation. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's a collaboration that's been going on for three years now. This is the fifth project we do together. And there, yeah, it's always a joy to work with this amazing man who's embodying all these incredible uh, material skills of how to improvise and use whatever's at hand to create and build. And you can see that if you go and look at the small hut that we built from an old car door. We made an oven from the car door and then we slowly just built this kind of improvised uh, small shack in the gallery. Um, yeah, so European everything, that project. So there's a video work that also uh, describes some of the thoughts behind it. Yeah. And the car is actually still standing in front of our door. <laughs> the car is e EU Guchant for two more years. <laughs> I still can't believe that we managed that. Yeah, we, we drove down here also making a road trip with the architecture collective that I'm uh, running with Einstein Tolleros here and, and uh, three other guys, Matti Aikio and uh, Hovar Arnhoff and Anders Rimpi. And uh, yeah, the result of that road trip is a road movie that you can see in Gallery 5 which is the FFB exhibition. There's also a vinyl record. We're really excited about that, finally having released the vinyl record. It's like a long dream. Um, so buy it. Axel thinks that we will only sell 30 copies during the whole exhibition. But I say that we're <laughs> definitely going to sell 100. So you, was, I think we, you, you, start, you thought it was no less than 200 we sell. I thought it was a bit high as an expectation. <laughs> Yeah, okay. We probably meet someone in the middle. Yeah, people should which listen still to it. Amazing. I think it's an yeah. epic record. And there's amazing artists on it. We didn't make the music ourselves. It's like music that was produced uh, through our projects. And there's incredible artists. Like Alexander has this uh, two pieces there that are really cool. And um, it's bangers. They're really, really great. <laughs> uh, you have to go check it out. And in the road movie, we're using, so there's some samples from the record. Yeah. So buy it. Things. Um, yeah, you pointed out a few people who uh, you collaborate with um, on an ongoing basis, almost. Uh, some are in the audience. Uh, it's really a family uh, production. It's maybe just important to mention that also, uh, maybe as, my, as the last point, that um, so many things uh, have been produced with others. Um, uh, and there's a lot of... Um, it's, it's, I guess artists always work with people, but usually they are kept invisible or maybe mentioned in a kind of small comment or so, but it's, for you, this is kind of a working practice and um, these collaborations are really um, mentioned and uh, you work with um, what people know and the skills they have and things they... Um, can bring to an exhibition. So it's really, um, it, instead of like uh, um, co-producers, it's more kind of super large scale, collaborative, ongoing project that you do mm. on an ongoing basis. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, together you're stronger. I think col collectivity and collaborations is like, you see it all over the art world. It's like, there has always been a lot of it. 
but it's starting to become more recognized and more lifted up as a as a really a true maybe a yeah uh, yeah I don't know we are I think we we we've seen sort of the end of this you know in the arc world of architecture we have this phrase called the, the star architect yeah and I think that's a really a very old-fashioned uh, way of sort of even thinking about creativity. Creativity is uh, is really about communication, and it's really about relations, and that's how it always was. So it's uh, I'm I'm glad to be able to yeah lift that up as a as a form of as a format or as a for, form of yeah, creating art. Yeah, it's, uh, I think you see it everywhere. It's yeah. Obvious. You know. Yeah, so and uh, actually, so today's uh, talk is um, the after opening talk, but we also have a lot of um, other uh, conversations and uh, events happening as part of the exhibition where we bring in even more collaborators, such as um, Matthias yeah. Danbold, Tone Husse, yeah. um, and many others. So that there's a lot of um, program coming up. Most of it, most events live in space, some we probably also have to move to a digital platform, but um, it's still important to mm. make them happen in some way. Kenneth Hopkins, for example, yep. uh, a curator from uh, Canada living in the US. Uh, we really want her to be part of uh, our conversations. Maybe it's a good moment to open up uh, to the audience if there are questions uh, as a Q&A um, since we stream, we uh, usually hand around a microphone, which we can't do. So uh, Scott has uh, agreed to uh, repeat questions that you uh, might have so that we have them also <laughs> audible on the stream. So if there's anybody wanting to follow up um, with a remark or question, No questions, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a really long day, so I'm actually, yeah. to be honest, very happy about that. Then we maybe, yeah, exactly. Um, it was a long day. Uh, we will have further conversations. There's a lot to see and uh, read downstairs, uh, watch. Probably also like, if we count all the videos, a couple of days uh, of uh, duration of video also in the exhibition. Uh, yeah, so please uh, enjoy, make use of it. Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, thank you, everybody online, for watching us. Um, thanks, you are. Thank you, Okay. <laughs>